So you might have clicked on this video because you've been hacked and you're not really interested in how it happened with me. So I'll say straight up front, what you need to do is you need to go to Twitter and you need to tweet Team YouTube, which you can see the account on the screen here. They'll get back in touch with you and then they'll take a look at your account and they'll put you in touch with the people who can recover the account for you. So now I'm going to explain to you how my account got hacked and hopefully that'll help you avoid a similar situation. Before I go into the explanation, I'm going to answer the most frequent question. Did you have MFA activated on your account? Yes, I did. I had it activated with backup codes, with SMS and also with an authentication app as well. So MFA was active on the account. So what actually happened? Well, I was fished. I'm as aware as anyone else of the dangers of phishing. I never click links. I never answer unknown emails. When I get something strange, I check the sender domain and I never give out personal information. However, it happened to me and I think it would be helpful to others if I explain my thought process at the time and how it led to me being caught. So it started with this email from Erica Welsh at Wondershare. The email is claiming to offer sponsorship on my videos if I plug the Wondershare software. When I received this, I was immediately skeptical. Nevertheless, I went to the website, opened the developer tools and had a poke around and it seemed okay. And amazingly, this alone satisfied my original suspicions. However, my channel is small. I wasn't really interested, but I'm polite most of the time because I'm from the UK. So I answered saying thanks and are they sure they have the right channel? The question there really is why why did I do this? Why did I not do what I normally do, which is at least look at the sender address and realize it's a scam and then delete the email? Well, this is the key question because we're all aware of the danger and potential of scam emails and phishing emails. And I hope by explaining why I did what I did that it can help you in the future. So there are a few reasons. The first one is the email arrived at a perfect time. I was snowed under with work and I was really distracted. Another reason is lately, especially since having the course on Udemy, which has run really, really well, but having that course on Udemy has meant that I've received a lot of emails from people I don't know, and most of them are needing coding help and support. And I'm used to opening emails from unknown senders and also from many countries as well. That brings me to the third point, and that is that the English in the email is perfect in its imperfection. I'm British, but I've lived outside the UK since 2006. So I'm very used to non-perfect English. And this email is not perfect, but it's also not Nigerian prince levels either. Therefore, it's in a style that I'm really used to seeing in my normal daily life. Another point is the sender name Erica with a K is really common in Germany where I live. The surname is not German, but through my moving around over the years, I happen to know a few dual nationality families. So the name combination here of sort of a German German first name and then a non-German second name was really normal to me. Now, of course, when I see this email, it screams scam, but it's really important for me and hopefully for you to understand the thought process that led me to actually getting scammed. And those are the main points that contributed. A short time later, I received a reply. You can see it here. And I've also opened up the sender address, which you can see is actually not from Wondershare. The email itself contains an offer and a couple of links to view a presentation of the sponsorship package. Again, this screams scam, but as I've explained, I just wasn't paying attention and I clicked the link. It downloaded the file, which was a screensaver file, which is usually a scam. And I know this. Nevertheless, I ran it anyway because, you know, I have multi-factor authentication. So what's the worst that can happen? When I actually ran it, it opened quickly and closed and nothing actually happened. And that was it until about 12 hours later. So at 3.59 on the 21st of November, I'm not going to forget this time or date, I received an email on my backup account saying that the YouTube account email had been recovered successfully. And I thought, what? I haven't actually done anything. Within one minute, I received seven more emails, each adding security codes or changing the backup and primary email addresses for the account. By 4.02 p.m. it was done and I was sitting there pretty much in shock. I tried to log into the account failed and saw that the account email had now been changed to gimmager9749 at rebeshi.com. So I was now out of my own account. I immediately went to Google's account recovery page, but nothing worked. Another thing that people often say to me is, have you tried the account recovery? Well, the scammers had changed everything. They'd changed the backup email, the alternate email, the security codes, and they even added a hardware security device. So nothing worked from Google's account recovery page. I then used Google's help to ask uh, for a phone call and they called me straight away and I spent half an hour on the phone with them. 
They were really nice. They could see the phone I was calling from was a device that's normally used to access the account. They asked me to try to log into the account from my laptop and they saw again that it was a device that's usually used to log into the account. However, they only allow you to recover your account via the recovery page. If this fails, you're basically screwed. And this is fair enough. It wouldn't be a good idea if they allowed people to get access to their accounts via a phone call. Then we'd have a much bigger security problems than we already have. At this point, I can't express how I felt here. So upset doesn't even come close. It's not just the YouTube channel, there's the Discord server, Twitter, and many, many other things are linked to that account and that email address. For example, I had to call my bank and close absolutely everything and create new accounts. So I found myself in a situation where a huge portion of my life could be accessed and taken over by someone else. And I can promise you, this isn't very nice. After a few hours, the decoration on the channel had changed and scam videos were being uploaded. The videos had comments on them that were clearly from scammers and the videos themselves were offering crack software that contained malware. And I'm pretty sure it's the malware that I ran that then gets people access to other accounts. So I had a pretty sleepless night. Uh, I set up a Discord, a new one in panic and also set up a new YouTube channel in panic and then went to the normal Discord and told everybody there what had happened. Luckily, the Discord members are a wonderful bunch of people and uh, here they really, really helped me and they helped a lot. The first thing I did was they reported the videos and they also reported the channel. And once I got the channel back, I actually saw the results of this. So basically everything in a very short space of time was blocked on the channel and the scammer couldn't upload anything new after about a day or so. One of the Discord members, I'm not going to name, but you know who you are, then wrote to me privately and they'd actually had the same experience with a family member who has a big YouTube channel and they'd also lost their channel and they'd been able to get it back. But instead of contacting Google, what I needed to do was contact YouTube and claim impersonation. So I followed this advice and tried to, on one of the videos on the channel, claim impersonation. I waited a couple of days and I still hadn't heard anything. So then what I did was I wrote to YouTube team on Twitter. This was kind of a last resort, but I wrote to YouTube team on uh, Twitter and amazingly, 20 minutes later, I had an answer. Once I explained to them what had happened, I'd also prepared a PDF document with all sorts of screenshots and things inside. So they had all of the details straight away. They immediately replied, uh, sending me a contact for the YouTube team that deals with account hacks. This team then sent me a form to fill in and this form is not accessible unless they release it for you. So you can find lots of Google searches of people trying to find this form. You don't have access to it unless they release it for you. And they actually send you a specific link that you have to click to then open the form. And when you do, it's actually already pre-filled with most of your details. What you have to do then is fill out a lot of other details. So it asks about your devices, all the locations you can think of that you've logged in from, any IP addresses you know, any access methods that you've previously used for getting into the account. So what do you use on your mobile, what do you use on your desktop, on your laptop, things like that. A huge amount of information. And here also I prepared them a quite a big PDF uh, with screenshots and details of basically everything I could find and everything that had happened during the hack. So I sent this form and I kid you not, about one hour after sending this form, I had an email and they'd already set my account up to be recovered by me. All I had to do was follow the guidelines they sent me, click on a couple of links, and I was able to change everything back and set up everything else as it was. So I cannot say thank you enough to the YouTube team. Um, if anybody from the YouTube team is watching this, please, I'm so, so grateful. I don't know who you are or where you are. If I did, I would send you something to show my gratitude. But anyway, thank you. So the question is, with multi-factor authentication, how did this hack happen? Because we're often told that MFA is the secure solution to everything. Well, the reality is it isn't. And if you're somebody who programs front ends and back ends with authorization, you'll know how this hack took place. But in case you don't, then I'm going to spend a couple of minutes explaining how the hack took place because you're probably in for a little bit of a shock. If you think about your mobile or your desktop and you open your email, let's say, or any other app where you have to log in, but let's just say email. If I open my Gmail on my Android phone, it doesn't ask me for my password every single time. Now and then it does, but most of the time it refreshes the email. Uh, I was with somebody yesterday discussing these things. Uh, it was to do with work. They opened Outlook on their phone and I pointed out to them, it hasn't asked you for your password. And they replied to me saying, yes, but that's because I'm logged in. And the question is, is how does the app know it's you? How does it know you're logged in? Well, when you first log in, you get something called a session cookie or a JWT, so a token or something else, but essentially think of it as a key. Okay, so you get something back 
which is a, an encrypted key. And this key is used to identify you. If you send this key with your request to the server, the server will know whether that key has come from the server and it will also find your details inside there and it uses that to authorize you. You can only get that key if you log in with your password and your multi-factor authentication. This key, however, has an expiry date. So I think when I looked, YouTube was about 24 hours or so or something like that. Some keys are much, much longer expiry date. The reason for the expiry date is if you don't do anything with the application for a long time and then try and use it, it'll send the key, the server will say it's expired, you need to log in again. When you're using the app, the app in the background constantly checks this expiry date and when it's about to run out or the key's about to run out, it'll send to the server request to get a new one with a new expiry date and you don't notice anything happening. What you see is that you're just saying logged in. If you click specifically log out, what happens with the log out is this key gets sent to the server and gets invalidated. Okay, so it gets set on the server as expired, which means when you click log out, if you try and go back to your email, you're asked to specifically log in again with your multi-factor authentication. The point is, is if you haven't clicked log out and you've just got your email or whatever the app is open or you're logged in automatically, then you'll have this token or this key in the cookies or in the local storage, which is used to identify you on the server. It's not using a password and it's not using your multi-factor because it's assuming that if you've got this key, then you've already done that process. So the hack was actually quite simple. I assumed that when I ran the software, it went into my user folder on Windows, took my cookies and sent them somewhere else to the scammers. Because I was logged in at the time, they actually had cookies and session tokens that were effectively logged in. And then they used these tokens to log into my account and the rest is history. And in fact, just to to show you, I typed out a curiosity YouTube sign in in cookie into Google and came across this Stack Exchange post, which is only a couple of years old, where somebody wanted to use their own session from YouTube in exactly the same way I was hacked. They're literally asking how to use the cookie to access their account because they want to avoid the MFA because they're automating something. So hopefully you've learned something from this video. Hopefully you're not laughing at me too much. I want to say thank you very much to all the people on the Discord for helping. Thank you very much to YouTube for helping me get it back and just let you know that all is well with the account now and everything hopefully is as it was before the hack. Thanks for watching.